Matthew chapter 2 and verse 15. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 15. And was there until the death of Herod, that it may be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Listen to that phrase. Out of Egypt I have called my son. It is a reference to Hosea 11. Hosea 11. If you go to Hosea 11 and verse 1, you're going to see where Matthew is quoting from. Matthew is looking at the book of Hosea, and he says, when Jesus was brought back from Egypt as a child, it was a fulfillment of this prophecy right here. Hosea 11, verse 1. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. There it is. That's the phrase that Matthew is referring to. That when Hosea said this, it was going to be fulfilled by Jesus in the future, being called out of Egypt. Now, we went through this um, in the last uh, program, verse 2. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Balaam and burned incense to graven images. I taught Ephraim also to go, taking them by their arms, but they knew not that I healed them. I drew them with cords of a man, with bands of love, and I was to them as they that take off the yoke of their jaws. And I laid meat unto them. He shall not return into the land of Egypt, but the Assyrian shall be his king, because they refuse to return. And the sword shall abide on his cities, and shall consume his branches, and devour him, because of their own counsels. And my people are bent to backsliding from me. Though they call them to the Most High, none at all will exalt him. Now, let's pray. Linda? Oh, yes, Lord. We just pray that you give us the words that will, will change our lives today, that everything that he says, that we all know is right on. That we will take something from what he says and think about it and change our lives. Out of Egypt I call my son. <clears throat> Matthew says that's a typology of Christ. That was speaking about the Messiah in a prophetic word from Hosea. When Hosea said this, Says Matthew, that's who he was talking about, Jesus. Now the next of the few verses refer to a backsliding people. A people who are in the promise of, of the Lord, who are seeking God in their own way, but who are backsliding. The word backsliding is used here. Some of the translations are translated as rebellion. A form of going your own way. Right here, as we spoke about in the last program, we, we say now that there are certain other things that are, that are signs of backsliding. Let me just point to one right here. He says, I was to them as him who take off the yoke from their neck. And he, he makes a reference to their jaw. And I set food before them. Now, the people he was talking to, because it was an agricultural community, they knew exactly what he was talking about. He was using a yoke of oxen as, a, as an example of God, as an owner who wants to feed his animals. It, it, he had to take off that thing from, from their neck. They would be usually paired. And when they took that off from them, also there was something that that did not allow them to eat because you did not want the animal to get distracted eating while you're trying to work with him. But you needed to take that off because you put pressure on their mouth. When you took that off, you put food in front of them or you cut them loose so that they could eat. That's the figure that he's given. What he's saying is this. I have made it possible to take off the pressures and the things that, that are on top of you, 
and I have gone out of my way to set you in a place where you can eat or to give you food. And yet you refuse to eat. That's another sign of a, of a backslider. That God presents himself and gives him food. He sets the table. He calls out to you in the middle of the night and says, I want to talk to you. I want to reveal myself to you. The Lord sends you to church and there's something coming through that comes straight from his heart. I know many times that's not true in every church. But there are times when God is doing that and the trembling of the heart is there and you refuse to eat. Or the times when God is calling out and he has sent somebody to speak to you and he's, he has sent somebody to draw you in and to give you an advice and you refuse the advice. Have you seen when, how when somebody sets their heels in, even though they know that they know that they're wrong and God has used different things to talk to them about it, they refuse it. That's the picture of a backslider here. This is something that, that you know, when, when, you, when you find, uh, 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 let, let me use an example, uh, you know, young people, when they fall in love, and even older people that can act this way too, they will say, I will never do that. I will never go this way. I will never do that. I will never, you know, backslide and go out against God in that situation. And all of a sudden, they find somebody, they, they, they're head over heels over. When, when they're really young, they think that's the life, and if they can't have him or her, they're going to die. And then you have a father or a mother who says, look, you know, he's, he doesn't really have it together. He's a drug addict or, you know, no, no. I mean, this is a person who, who's known for violence or, 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 you, or you go into that, that place. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, what a parent. A parent usually never likes anybody that their kid brings home. But I'm talking about the whole idea of not listening when God is knocking on your door. A pastor approaches the person. A sermon is talking to them. Even a song brings conviction to the heart, but they refuse to eat of the table of the Lord. They say, no, I don't want it. Because I have to have my way. That's a backslider. I have to do what I want to do. And this is something I want to do. I want to close my ears. I don't want to hear what God says. God says, I was like that owner who took off the thing of your faith, who freed your mouth and set food in front of you and you will not eat it. He makes another reference. He said, I draw you in with cords of a human, with human cords, with cords of a man. And I wanted to have a relationship with you. Scholars differ in what they think that is. Some scholars think this is a reference to treating someone like a human rather than an animal. The way that I see it, it looks to me like God is saying, I have found a way to level with you in the place where you are at. For God who is divine and God who is in the heaven says, I have found a way to speak to you in human terms and things that you may understand. Listen to what it says in verse 4. I drew them with course of a man with bands of love. He says, he says, as God, he says, I spoke to you the way humans speak to each other. I found ways to show you. You know what? There's a new phrase around. I, know, I don't know if, if it's not actually that new, but it's used a lot. Love language. I like it when they have little cute phrases like that. What's your love language? I think my love language is food, but we're going to leave that alone. The whole idea of this, of this thing that God says, with course of men, I talk love to you. Meaning that he came to you as Emmanuel, God with us. It means I've been talking to, about love for, for you from heaven, but you think, well, you're God, you're all the way over there. How could you know what I feel? So he comes and he puts this body and he walks among us, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. 
And he says, I felt it now. I know what it is to be tired. I know what it is to be hungry. I know what it is to have pressure and to have people against you. I know what it is to have enemies. I know what it is it feels to have pain. I know what it is to have tears. I know what it is to smile. And I still found a way to speak to you and tell you I love you. In fact, the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus upon the cross both men, uh, men and God, as he's, as he's crucified, the Bible will de describe to you that that's the ultimate sign of his love. I drew them with cords of a man. I told you in the beginning it was a messianic thing. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Jesus never, never, ever, ever backslid. He came perfect and he left perfect. But he did set a path for us. And it is no accident that when Hosea is saying that that verse, he is going to tell us all of the things that have to do with backsliding, or many of them anyway. Jesus will not only show you the path to salvation, he will show you the path, how do you get out of Egypt? He defeated every single one of the steps that I spoke about in the last two days. His communication with the Father, which when I spoke about the incense, was constant. His prayer, his desire, his sacrifice was unto God. He related com completely and walked in the light of God. He did defeat everything. He showed us the path how to get out of Egypt. Hosea says, this is what happens. And he describes to us how you backslide and some of the signs. Jesus said, is said to have come out of Egypt, not because he was backsliding, but because God wanted to show us that there is a path and a way in which you can walk where you will not backslide. Jesus did not backslide, ever. This stuff brings conviction to me as I read it. I tell you, because there are many times when I have read this list that Hosea puts out, and I have found that there are things that cause struggle to my life. Sometimes the sacrifice of my life is not unto the Lord. I'm not offering myself as a living sacrifice, living and acceptable, holy and acceptable in his presence. There are times when I, my efforts are in other things and in other places, not in the Lord. There are times when my running is to consult this and that rather than consult the Lord. And there are times then when he has slayed the food in front of me and I have not eaten. How sad it is, and here I will speak to the preachers. How sad it is when you have prepared yourself and you spend time with the Lord, and you know that you know God has laid a good word in your spirit. And I'm talking about something that comes from the spirit, not from your intellect. And you laid it out, and it's not eaten. It's an abandoned meal. Feel like a mother who spends so many hours getting something together and puts it on the table and is untouched. I found, I remember, uh, you know how they have these potlucks at church, and we knew this lady who was very, I don't know, delicate, I want to say it, that if she brought her food and people did not eat it, she got a little hurt. She wasn't ugly, she was just hurt, like, okay, I made this food and nobody touched it. She wasn't a very good cook, so not a lot of people touched her food. But I remember... <laughs> This one time, we got there, and everybody was sitting down, and the bowl was empty, and I had noticed. So I asked a couple of the guys, I said, wow, did she make something better this time? And they told me, no, her husband ate it all. So I went over to her husband, and I said, I, you liked it, right? He goes, no, I hated it, but I want her happy. And in that, 
what, which got into my, into my spirit from, from some years ago, I tell you something. It is a happy time for the Lord who is the best of cooks spiritually when he lays something before you and you enjoy it and you eat it. I was to you as one who set food in your table and took off the yoke from your face and from your shoulder that you may eat of the food that I have given you and you wouldn't touch it. How many times have I been in a service where God is moving strongly and there are some who are in trouble with the scriptures of the Lord. I'm not even talking about me preaching. I'm talking about me sitting there. And then I'm looking on the sides and people are doing something. Some on their phones. Some playing with their children. Some have sleep. Don't even want to. And I know there are some of us who are boring. I get that. Or sometimes we're tired. I get that too. But many times it's an attitude. God sets the table and you don't want to eat it. It happens when God is with you in an open, in a, in a place, your place of prayer. When God is moving to reach you and to touch you and to do something powerful for you. And somewhere in that process, you do not understand that he's trying to feed you. Remember a particular time when he spoke to me, about 3 a.m. And I remember I was very tired. And I asked God, can we do this a little later? And you know, I mean, let's just, let's, just, let's just do it a little later. And I could sense that he wanted to talk to me, that he wanted to give me something. I had been asking him for something in the scriptures, a question in my spirit. And I knew Instinctively, that's what he wanted to give me. I told him to wait, run over here, did what I needed to do, went back and, and, and went into prayer. And I clearly knew as I opened up the scriptures, I'm done, it's not, I'm not going to give it to you anymore. Why? Because he sets the time. He sets the table. He knows what he wants to give you and he gives it to you in his own time. You don't dictate to him and tell him, well, when I'm not busy, when I am in a better mood, when I can get up, when I'm not tired, that's when we talk. Not working that way. That's not how it is. It doesn't work that way. He says, I was the one who took it off your shoulders. I was the one who set food in front of you. You are the one who's supposed to eat it. And in the presence of the Lord, as you look at that and you look at his his effort to reach to you, you have to know that your spirit needs to respond to him. Otherwise, it's a sign of backsliding. People who do not want to eat of his stable are backsliding. Within the kingdom, maybe not outside of the kingdom, but within the kingdom. Now, the, the, the reason I'm saying these things are not for us to beat up ourselves and say, oh, you know, I am failing. That's not the... The reason, that's the work of the Holy Spirit and conviction. The reason I'm saying this is because God wants to draw you toward him and move you in a different direction that you may know what he desires for you. If you want to reach the goals of life, if you want to get to the place where God and you are in unity, if you want to see the fulfillment of the reason you were born, it is not going to be found in a backsliding stage. Not out there, no. It will be found in the intimacy of the Lord and the prayer of desire and being where you need to be when he decides to talk to you and answering the call where it needs to and putting your sacrifice before him and waving your insincerity that the prayer will go to him and understanding that he's reaching to you and with, with, with course of a man, the Bible says that you may understand who he is. The highest times in my life has not been behind a pulpit. The highest times in my life has been in a secret place in the presence of God. When he, I know that I know that I know he's right there. When I can tell him, 
the aches and pains and the glory and giving glory for who he is. The aches and pains of my life, but at the same time, the glory of who he is. And when he can embrace me, that's the height of life. And if that sounds boring, then God is going to sound boring to you. May the Lord help us not to backslide within the kingdom. God bless you.